I'd like to start by asking a question. How many of you like to lose all the time? How many of you like to win? Now, I like to win so much when you play those games that have the little hourglass. If you're not looking at me, I'm going tap, 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 tap to make that sand fall a little bit faster because I like to win. But the unfortunate thing is today, most Christians are in that position. See, most Christians are playing a game where they're on the defense all the time. See, if you play a game, all you have is defense and you have no offense, what's the best you can ever hope to do? Tie, and most of the time you're going to lose. So what we want to do here today is a, is a little apologetics. I want to show you the three parts to apologetics. One part we're very familiar with, knowing how to answer questions, knowing how to answer the challenges. A second part of apologetics is knowing how to ask the right questions. And the third part for Christian apologetics is how to take that discussion back to the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ where it should be. So we're going to do a little bit of that. Strategic evangelism, or four power questions to ask an evolutionist. Four power questions. And our roadmap through here will be the Bible has answers, the origin of the universe, the origin of life, the fossil record, and the origin of dinosaurs. We're going to do all that in about 55 minutes, and you will understand it. <laughs> That's how Marines talk. So let me start here. Here's a professor at Cornell University. Here's where we send our children to be educated, and this is what they're taught. Let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear. There are no gods, no purposes, no goal-directed forces of any kind. Now, is that a true statement? Well, let's take a look what the Bible does have to teach. What we want to do is lay a foundation. Does the Bible give us a firm foundation, a rock solid foundation to stand on? Well, let me go through some questions here. Does the Bible tell us who created? Yeah. Yes, it does. All through the Bible we see the theme, God is the creator. Does the Bible tell us what was created? Yes, it does. It says God created all things. But here's where some controversy comes in. Does the Bible really tell us how God created? I talk to these religion teachers at some of these so-called universities, and they're training their students that the Bible really doesn't teach how God created. If they'd only read the Bible, they'd find an answer. Because in the first chapter of Genesis, it says, and God said multiple times, it tells us right there how He created, He's spoken into existence by His great power. Psalm 33, 6 and 9, we see the phrase, by the word of the Lord. Even the New Testament teaches how God created. Hebrews 11, 3, through faith we understand the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so things which are seen were not made out of things which do appear. So the Bible clearly tells us how God created, and it is not open to anybody's opinion. But now, does the Bible teach when God created? And yes, it does. And nobody disagrees with this. Everybody agrees. It's called in the beginning. But what about how long did it take God to create? And the Bible's also very explicit on this. Six days. Six days. Does everybody believe that? No, but many scholars do. The most widely recognized Hebrew lexicons and dictionaries published in the 20th century. Now, wait a minute. Lexicons? Who writes lexicons? Well, that's very easy. Lexicographers. <laughs> now, who are your lexicographers? They are some of the top Hebrew scholars, and what do they say? Creation days were literal days. So many of your top Hebrew scholars believe that. There are many scientists that believe exactly that, that God created everything in six days about 6,000 years ago. This is just a partial list of the scientists that believe this. So Hebrew scholars and many scientists from all walks of science believe that God created everything in six days. Oh, but Mike, 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 you don't understand. You just don't understand this. Genesis is not real history. It's more of just an allegory, good for spiritual teaching. Now, I love it when people make that statement. I, well, I just love that kind of a statement. Because here's what I'm going to do. I want to ask you a question. How many of you out there believe the Ten Commandments? Anybody here really believe those Ten Commandments? Well, okay. Do you really believe they really happened? Do you think they're really, God really wrote those things down in history? Well, now let me challenge you again. If I were to ask you to go to the book of Exodus and open that up, could you really understand what the Ten Commandments teach? 
Well, let me give you a couple of illustrations. How about this one? Thou shall not steal. Is that an allegory? Is that real? That's real. We can understand that. The language we can really understand, thou shall not steal. It's not hard, is it? How about another one? Thou shall not murder. Is that an allegory? We hope not. So that's real history. So you agree that the Ten Commandments are real history. They really happened, and we can understand them. So let's go to commandment number four in Exodus 20, verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. You just agreed that that's real history, and we can really understand it. Six literal days. Therefore, I like that word therefore. Therefore, if we don't believe Genesis is real history, then we can throw away the Ten Commandments because we just said we don't believe them anymore and we cannot understand them. Do you see the tie-in? It's not just the book of Genesis. A belief in a, our history goes all the way through the Bible. If we can't trust or believe that Genesis chapter 1, six days is six days, then why in the world do we believe the Ten Commandments? You see the tie-in there. Incidentally, this is a, a type of reasoning called leading the witness. <laughs> Lawyers love this. So we know we have a foundation. We know who created, what was created, how it was created, when it was created, and how long it took to create. We have a firm, rock-solid foundation. We have answers. So what is evolution then? You know the sad thing about this is? I can go out and ask 10 different evolutionists to give me a definition of evolution. I'll get 10 different answers. Isn't that sad? No wonder our children are in such confusion. There's no set standard or definition of evolution. So what is it? Evolution is based on something called materialism. That is the ideology that all that exists in this universe is mass and energy. It is the ideology that there is no creator God. Folks, if there's no creator God, there is no Jesus Christ, because the Bible clearly teaches Jesus Christ was the creator. In other words, if evolution, therefore, is true, then the Bible has to be wrong. But if the Bible is true, then evolution has to be wrong. So let's get into this apologetics now. Now that we've laid a foundation, we've seen that the Bible does supply answers. We know who created, what was created, how it was created, when it was created, and how long it took to create. But what do the evolutionists know? Do they have a foundation? Well, let's start with power question number one, which is going to deal with the origin of the universe. What do we know? Well, we're being taught that about 13 to 15 billion years ago, there was a sudden big bang explosion. It was a hot fireball, an expansion of space and time. And that is a wonderful story, just a great story. But the question we need to ask is, where did the matter come from to create that great big fireball? That is a wonderful question. So our power question number one is, where did the matter come from to create the Big Bang? And the answer is I get a lot of time, oh, Mike, let, let's not talk about that. Science doesn't deal with that. You know what? If science doesn't deal with that, that means only one alternative. Are you telling me that in the beginning God created? No, we can't have that. We can't have that. But you know, there's a big problem here. See, you can't have a Big Bang because you cannot have something go bang until you have something that can go bang. I want to know where the matter came from. That is a perfectly legitimate scientific question. Where did your matter come from to create your Big Bang? And since evolution is based on materialism, all that exists is mass and energy, they do not allow for any supernatural. They have a big problem. Now I'm going to give you some ideas where some of these evolutionists think it came from. Here's Dr. Paul Davies, Ph.D. in physics, wrote a book called The Edge of Infinity, 1995, and he clearly explains where that matter came from. Now remember, evolution is based on materialism, no supernatural, no miracles, but here's what he says. The Big Bang represents the instantaneous suspension of physical laws. The sudden abrupt flash of lawlessness that allowed something to come out of nothing represents a true, what's that word? Miracle. No wonder our students are so confused. Out of one side they say no miracles, no faith, no supernatural, and then they go off and say there's miracles. You know there's a big difference between our miracles and evolutionist miracles? In the Bible we have miracles. We, we recognize there's miracles all through the Bible, but we have a miracle maker, don't we? So at least we have a reasonable faith. Evolution clearly requires miracles, but they have no miracle maker. That is called a blind faith. Now, 
let me give you another idea here out of Discover Magazine. This one might be a little difficult to read because it's bilingual, so bear with me on this. The universe burst into something from absolutely nothing, zero, nada. And as it got bigger, it came filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. Isn't that a marvelous statement? <laughs> Discover Magazine giving us all the science we never wanted to know. <laughs> now Joseph Silk, PhD astronomer and an evolutionist, wrote a book called The Big Bang. Now this man does give a very honest answer. I'll give him credit for giving a very honest answer here. It is only fair to say we still have a theory without a beginning. That is a very fair statement. No beginning for what they believe. Here's another gentleman, Sten Odenwald makes this statement, also an evolutionist, and wrote the book The Astronomy Cafe. Astronomers have not the slightest evidence for the supposed quantum production of the universe out of a primordial nothingness. No clue for where the whole idea comes from. But I'm going to tell you how it happened. Now you all look like you like physics out there. You know why you like physics? Because physics is fun. How many like, I know, physics is fun, isn't it? Physics is fun. But you look like you're a little more advanced now. So we're not going to stop at physics here. We're going to go into a little quantum physics. You look like you're ready for this. Quantum physics. Because I'm going to need quantum physics to explain how that matter got here. Now this does get a little technical. If I get too technical, stop me and I'll repeat. If I get a little bit going too fast, stop me and I'll repeat. So here's how I got here based on quantum physics. There was nothing, then there was something. Did I go too fast for anybody? They got a little too technical? But they give that a name sometimes, and it's called a quantum fluctuation. That is another name for magic. <laughs> Folks, from nothing, nothing comes. Oh, but Mike, wait a minute. You're trying to get me on this where the matter came from. Why don't you tell me where God came from? You know the sad part about this is? That's where most Christians crumble right there. They cannot give a good explanation for where God came from. Let's tackle this problem. First of all, if you're a Christian, we can go to the Bible. And it says, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And we also see in Revelation, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. In other words, the Bible teaches very clearly God is a self-eternal being. He has no beginning, no end. That's what the Bible teaches. Well, many evolutionists don't believe that. They have a different worldview that says there is no creator God. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to answer this question. We answered it with the Bible. Why the Bible? Because that is our most powerful tool we have. Our first source should always be God's Word. Then I'm going to use the other source that God gives us, His creation. And I'm going to pose three possibilities here for where the universe came from. The universe created itself, the universe has always existed, and the universe was created. Those are the only three legitimate possibilities. And I know some people say, oh, Mike, there's a fourth one. There is no reality. I, I think that's a great statement because as soon as somebody says there's no reality, I reach around the back of their pocket, take out their wallet with a complaint, I say it never really existed. <laughs> so these are the only three legitimate choices. The universe created itself, the universe has always existed, or it had to be created. Well, let's start with number one, and I'll ask two questions. Can something create itself? Can, well, in other words, can that chair you're sitting in create itself? No. Can the vehicle you drive or hope to drive create itself? No. Can you create yourself? Absolutely not. Something cannot create itself. Question number two, can nothing, an absolute void, nothing create something? The answer has to be no, because we know from the Latin, from nothing, Nothing comes. Something cannot create itself. Nothing cannot create something. And that would also violate the law of cause and effect, which says for every effect there must be an equal to a greater cause. Folks, if you're going to have nothing create something, we have a violation of that law. Because the effect cannot be greater than the cause. And nothing cannot be greater than something. Therefore, I love that word, therefore. Therefore, we can conclude, based on the laws of science, the universe could not have created itself. The laws of science and logic clearly teach the universe could not have created itself. That leaves us only two options now. 
The universe has always existed, it is eternal, or there had to be a creator. These are the only two options we have now. So let's examine the universe has always existed. And we're going to go to one of the laws of science called the second law of thermodynamics. Now the second law of thermodynamics, I'm trying to say that slow now, because if you haven't noticed, I do have a speech impediment. I do not breathe when I talk. It basically teaches that the whole universe as a whole is losing its available energy for doing usable work. In other words, the usable energy in this universe is wearing down. It's constantly wearing down. In small pockets we might borrow a little energy from here to supply over here, but the universe as a whole is losing its energy, losing its heat energy. In other words, molecules as a whole, as a whole are slowing down. Therefore, if this universe was eternal, we would be in what is called a virtual heat death, meaning there would be virtually no molecular movement. Everything would have lost its available heat energy for doing work. Therefore, the universe cannot be eternal. It had to have a beginning. So our three possibilities now, the universe created itself has to be false based on the laws of science and logic. The universe has always existed has to be false based on the laws of science and logic. That leaves us one possibility. Based on science, there can only be one possibility, and that is in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. See, God gave us two sources of information, two sources of knowledge. His Word which clearly teaches He's the creator of all things, and His creation, which verifies that there had to be a creator. We can use them both. Now, let's take this to the next stage now, strategic evangelism. We've just shown how to ask a question. Where did the matter come from? Now we need to take that question to the gospel where the power is. If evolution is unable to explain the origin of matter and energy through naturalistic means, it is without a foundation. Why should I accept evolution when you cannot produce the evidence? I already have a faith. Tell me about your faith and I will tell you about my faith. And oh, by the way, would you tell me what your faith has to offer me and I'll tell you what my faith in Jesus Christ has to offer you. You see how we do that? One power question, where did the matter come from? They have no foundation, no answer. We do. If they have no foundation, no answer, they're asking us to accept evolution by faith, and we already have a faith, and our faith has answers. Therefore, it is logical and reasonable to believe that God, not unknown magical events, created the universe. See, we have a rock-solid foundation. We know who created what was created, how it was created, when it was created, how long it took to create. We have answers. They're in God's Word. So for the evolutionists to have no foundation. So let's go to our power question number two, which is the origin of life. How did life originate? There's only two possible answers to that question. Life evolved by natural processes or life was created. There are no third choices. People say, oh, Mike, you're being awful narrow-minded about this. There are other ways we could have gotten here. My response to that is, name one. I have never had anybody name a third possible way we could have gotten here. Oh, but my, we came from outer space. Does that really answer the question how life originated? No, it doesn't. Just pushes the question to outer space. The question is how did life originate? And only two possibilities. Now the model of evolution teaches that about four and a half billion years ago, the earth formed all by naturalistic processes. This is their foundation for how life got started. Then over long periods of time, chemicals began to form in a pool where they've nicknamed the primordial soup. Then over more long periods of time, these chemicals bonded together to make molecules. And finally, over more long periods of time, these molecules bonded together to make the first living cell. And we have our formula, time plus chance equals life. Does that make you feel pretty good about yourself? Something exploded, formed a pool of chemicals, and here you are. That gives you some self-worth there. You know, the Bible teaches something very different from this. Probably one of the best verses in the Bible dealing with creation comes out of the New Testament. 
Colossians 1.16. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things are created by Him and for Him. Notice the use of the word all there. You know what all means? All. But you know, God made sure we understood it meant all. Notice the phrase, visible and invisible things. Doesn't that cover all things? The things we can see and the things we can't see means all. So God was very explicit that He created all things out of Colossians 1.16. So we have a difference on how life originated. Now before we get into this a little bit more, I need to do a little review. I need to review some biology terms. Now the reason I take time to do this is because sometimes we have people coming to these lectures who have been out of the biology classroom for maybe a year or two. So we need to do a little review here, a little refresher. Now our first term are the atom. What are atoms? They're our basic unit of matter. That's not too hard. Basic unit of matter. Now what do atoms like to do? Well sometimes atoms will bond together to make things known as molecules. And we're all familiar with the molecule water, H2O. So atoms can bond together to make molecules. Now what do molecules do? Well, molecules can bond together to make amino acids. So amino acids are very important. Why? Because sometimes they're considered the building blocks of life or building blocks of proteins. In other words, if you can't get amino acids, you can't get life. So they're very important. And then finally, what will amino acids do? Well, sometimes they will bond together to make proteins. So atoms can make molecules. Molecules can bond together to make amino acids. And amino acids can bond together to make proteins. Doesn't that make biology really simple now? See how easy biology really is? Well, there's a little more than that. But that's all we need to get through this section. Now, this picture I'm showing up here is in just about every biology textbook in this country. It's called the Miller Experiment. In the 1950s, Miller set out to create the building blocks of life. Now notice I didn't say life. His objective was not to create life, but to create the building blocks of life. So Miller built this spark chamber in his laboratory. In there he tried to simulate the Earth's atmosphere of billions of years ago. So he put gases in there such as methane, ammonia, and he left oxygen out. Then he generated electrical sparks in there to drive the chemical reactions. Then it goes on to state that Miller got amino acids. And that is a fact. Miller did get amino acids. So what they're teaching is why do we need a creator God when we can do it ourselves? That's the teaching our students get in many schools today. But to coin somebody else's phrases here, let's look at the rest of the story. Let's look at those pieces and do a little critical thinking. Number one, why did Miller use, his, the, use the gases he did? And question number two, what type of amino acids did Miller get? They don't tell us that. Did he get the right kind for life or did he get something else? Now we could go on and do other questions about this, but all we're going to need is two here. So let's start with the oxygen in life. Miller left oxygen out of his experiment. Why did he do that? Well, he had to. See, he knew, based on empirical science, observable and repeatable science, that in the presence of oxygen, life cannot start. See, oxygen is necessary for life to sustain life, but it is detrimental to the origin of life. It just destroys the molecular bonds. So Miller left oxygen out. But what does the scientific evidence tell us about this Earth? It says, the only trend in the recent literature is the suggestion of far more oxygen in the early atmosphere than anyone imagined. In other words, the scientific evidence overwhelmingly concurs that this planet has always had freestanding oxygen in the atmosphere. So the evidence by our textbook authors is being ignored. So let's do that also. Let's play the game and we will ignore the scientific evidence. So if we take all the oxygen out of the atmosphere, we also take something very important away. Anybody know what that happens to be? It begins with an O. The ozone, made out of oxygen, O3. You know what happens when we take that ozone away? We all become instant crispy critters. Because the ultraviolet rays of that sun will just come down and fry all life. So what we know based on observable and repeatable science is that Life cannot start with the presence of oxygen and it cannot start without oxygen. Isn't that good news? 
It's starting to look like we might need a creator here. Wow. But we do have to address this other issue. Miller did get amino acids. So we have to address that. But there's something interesting about these amino acids. First of all, there's about 2,000 different types of amino acids out there, but only 20 are used in life. That means life is very selective. You get one of these wrong amino acids, you, you could be in big trouble. Now these amino acids come in two shapes. Just like we have a left hand, we have a right hand. My left and right hand are about the same, aren't they? Four fingers and a thumb. But are they really the same? Not quite. Notice what happens when I put one hand behind the other. Notice the thumb and the fingers are on the opposite side. So they're not quite the same. So your left and right hand are what you call mirror images of each other. Now why is this important? See, this is important because these amino acids come in two shapes. Guess what we call them? Left-handed amino acids and right-handed amino acids. What's the difference? Well, just like our hands, left and right-handed amino acids have the same components, same atoms. And also like our hands, left and right-handed amino acids are mirror images of each other. Now, why is this so important? This is important because every amino acid in every protein in your body, and you have trillions of these, is left-handed. You do not have a single right-handed amino acid in any protein in your body. Matter of fact, every life form, all of life, has 100% left-handed amino acids in every protein. There are no right-handed amino acids known to be used in any proteins in life anywhere. Now, why is this important? This is important because of what our textbook authors fail to put in the textbooks. What Miller really ended up with was an even mixture of 50% left-handed and 50% right-handed amino acids. Folks, that is not life. That is like a poison to life. Every experiment we have ever done has always ended up with about an even mixture of left and right-handed amino acids. Every one has failed. Even when we start with all left-handed amino acids, we can do that, put them over here. When we start with all left-handed amino acids, they will naturally start reverting back to a mixture of left and right-handedness. In other words, the tendency is always away from life, never towards life. So how could it get started? But it gets better. The more you learn about science, the more you see there has to be a crater. When we die, we're made up 100% left-handed amino acids. When we die and we become as dead as we can be, and that's going to be pretty dead, do you know what happens to our 100% left-handed amino acids? They start reverting back to a mixture of left and right-handedness. What did Miller really simulate? Death, a poison to life. The whole experiment is a known and recognized failure. So the question I have then is, why do they continue to put known wrong information in textbooks? Well, I'm going to simulate why they do this. Now, in order to simulate this, I need to create a little bit of anxiety in some of you here today. And incidentally, my spiritual gift is creating anxiety in other people. <laughs> so here's how I'm going to do this. I'm going to give you a math problem. That's enough for some of you right there. Now, I'm going to give you this math problem, and you all must have an answer. Why? because I'm going to call on you. Notice I slowed this part of the talk down because I really enjoy this. <laughs> Matter of fact, I'm going to call on you even if you aren't looking at me. <laughs> so let me give you this math problem. And before you try and answer, let me qualify with the answers you can have. So here's your problem. How much is 3 plus 1, and you cannot use the number 4 because I don't like the way it looks. It's a little bit too religious for me, and we're talking science here. Now, I will not even accept 3.999 repeating because I want an exact number. I don't want to see any fingers. Keep your shoes on. Don't want to see any toes. I don't want it spelled out. I don't want any formulas like 10 minus 6 or 2 squared. If you're multilingual, I want your answer in English. No Roman numerals, and if you're a computer person, I want your answer in base 10. 
You give me one of these wrong religious answers, you will be up here doing push-ups until I get tired. <laughs> so before I start calling anybody, anybody volunteer, how much is three plus one? We have an answer right back there. That is a formula. I hope you can do a lot of push-ups because I don't get tired very easy. Well, l let me do this military way. I'm going to do this military way. Uh, sir, you moved. You volunteered. <laughs> and you were going to say seven, weren't you? That is correct. Seven is a correct answer. Thank you very, very much. Oh, I'm looking. Oh, thank you for volunteering right there. I saw you move. That's a volunteer. And you were going to say what, 13? That is correct. We have seven and 13 are correct answers. Oh, right over here. We have a volunteer. Thank you very much. And you were thinking six, weren't you? And that is correct also. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. How can all these answers like seven and 13 and six be correct to a simple little problem like three plus one? Here's your answer. See, if you rule the truth out, if you cannot accept the truth, you have to accept anything in its place. And that is what evolution is. They have ruled out the truth of a creator God and must put anything in its place. Even to the point today of teaching our students that three plus one can equal seven. That is the exact kind of teaching they're doing when they teach the Miller experiment succeeded when it is known to be wrong. What we are observing today out of our universities and high schools is our students are coming out of those schools repeating the same mistakes we did 30 years ago because we're unwilling to teach all the scientific evidence. Oh, but Mike, Mike, I got a counter argument. Just give it enough time and it will happen. I have two questions about that statement. Number one, is that a valid statement? Is that even a scientific statement? And the answer is no to both. Has nothing to do with science. Because here's what that statement, given enough time will happen, here's what it really says. We don't know how it happened, but given enough time, we have faith it will. It is a faith statement which should not be allowed in our science classrooms. I'd like to take you to a little mathematics. Now that you have a firm understanding of quantum physics, I'd like to take you to some higher mathematics now called the laws of probability. Law of large numbers. 10 to the minus 50th power. Now, I know a lot of people don't like to work in fractions, so what I'm going to do here to make it this easier, just drop the minus sign. We'll call it 10 to the 50th power. The problem will work the same here. 10 to the 50th power. That is a very big number. Very big number. One followed by 50 zeros. If the chances of an event to occur are greater than this number, that event will never happen. Oh, but Mike, probabilities deal with small numbers and they can never get to be absolutely zero, and I know that. But to assume this could still happen, an event greater than that probability, is a faith statement because nobody has ever, get this word, observed that to occur. So it's strictly a faith statement. Let's take a look at that probability. The mathematicians and scientists get together and they calculate the probability of a single protein coming by random chance. Just a single protein. And cells have thousands of these and we're not even close to life yet. They calculate that probability not 10 to the 50th, but 10 to the 191st power. Just to get a single protein is beyond the laws of probability. But it gets better. It just keeps on getting better. What do the scientists calculate as the probability of a cell occurring by random chance? Now we're finally at life, and they calculate that probability at 10 to the 40,000th power. Now, if we've really proven anything, what we have just proven is Romans 1, 19 and 20, that God has given us all the evidence and no one has an excuse for not believing in a creator. In other words, in everybody's heart of hearts, they know there is a creator. It's just that some people willfully choose to reject that. Romans 1, 19 and 20, all the science confirms that. Now let's see what some of the scientists have to say. Here's John Joe McFadden, professor of molecular biology and quantum physics. This man is an evolutionist. He wrote a book called Quantum Evolution. I went through his entire book and here's his conclusion. The simplest living cell could not have arisen by chance. Here's a man who makes that statement, but yet he continues to believe in evolution. Why? Because he has willfully rejected the Creator God. 
Here's another gentleman, Franklin M. Harrell, Professor of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at Colorado State University, wrote a book called The Way of the Cell. Went through his book, and here's what he has to say. The origin of life is also a stubborn problem with no solution in sight. Here's another man who says, we don't know how life could start, but yet he continues to have faith in why? Because he has willfully rejected a creator God, Romans 1, 19 and 20. That's the science. We've had two power questions. Where do we take this question? If evolution is unable to explain the origin of life through naturalistic means and without a foundation, why should I accept evolution when you cannot produce the evidence? I already have a faith. Tell me about your faith and I'll tell you about my faith. And oh, by the way, would you tell me what your faith has to offer me and I'll tell you what my faith in Jesus Christ has to offer you. We just took it back to the gospel. Two power questions. Where did the matter come from? How did life originate? Therefore, it is logical and reasonable to believe that God, not unknown events, created life. You see, evolution does not have a foundation. We do. We have a rock-solid foundation. We know who created it, what was created, how it was created, when it was created, and how long it took to create. So now let's go to the third power question, which is going to deal with the fossil record. Oh, Mike, Mike, Mike. We don't have enough time. I look at my watch. We don't have enough time to do this fossil record. There's books this thick on the fossil record. And I know that. But I'm going to show you how to do the entire fossil record in six minutes. See, it's all about apologetics, learning how to ask the right question. The fossil record. Here's our typical scenario we see out there. This, this geologic column with all these creatures from the least complex moving up and up and up to the more complex as we move up that column. Well, that's all nice, but you don't have to go all through that geologic column. All you got to do is go down to the foundation. See, that's what we're talking about here is foundations, the right questions to ask to get at the foundation. All you need to do is go down to the Precambrian and Cambrian time periods. So what I want to do now is put this chart up here. I want to look at this. Now, I've got this chart on the vertical. I have the time. On the bottom, going horizontal, I have something called morphology. Mm -mm. Here's one of those words, scientific words, morphology. Question, anybody here have morphology? Raise your hand if you think you have morphology here. Just a couple of you. Want, you people want to move away from them? <laughs> morphology. Well, give you an idea. If you don't have morphology, you are a blob. See, morphology just means shape. So vertical, I have the timeline on the bottom. Going horizontal, I have morphology. Now Darwinian evolution, if it's true, we start with this single cell. Oh, wait a minute. Start with a single cell? How many steps did I just skip? How many millions of steps did I just skip? You see, it goes back to the origin of life, doesn't it? How did you get that first cell? They can't answer that question. See, I don't like to let them assume these things. They're claiming to be scientific. Let's get rid of their assumptions. You can't assume a cell came into being. We already saw that that can't happen by any known science. But we'll just start here. They've got that single cell. Then they have this tree of life branching up to all these diversity and complex creatures. Now, if evolution is true, if it really is true, we should find all the transitions between the Cambrian and Precambrian, the Precambrian and Cambrian. We should find single cell, which we do. We should find two cell, ten cell, hundred cell, thousand cell, million cell creatures. If evolution is true, we must find that. But in fact, what we find in the fossil record is the appearance of very complex creatures with zero transitions. Anybody know how much zero is? Zero. Zero. In other words, the fossil record, the foundation for the rock fossil record is missing. You don't have to go anywhere else. And I won't even settle for two or three or four alleged transitions, folks. There needs to be millions of transitions before I will accept evolution. I need to see the observable evidence. Why? Because great claims require real evidence. Oh, but Mike, 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 what about these wheels with legs we found? There are certainly transitions. Folks, we have found four-inch knobs on a 70-foot whale. You know what a four-inch knob on a 70-foot whale is? It's not a leg, it's a pimple. <laughs> Fossil record, Ernst Mayer, former professor of zoology at Harvard University, considered to be Darwin of the 20th century, wrote a book called What Evolution Is. I went through his entire book, and he starts off this way. He says, given the fact of evolution, notice he calls evolution a fact. Here's how he supports his facts. 
One would expect the fossils to document a gradual steady change from ancestral forms to the descendants, but this is not what the paleontologist finds. Instead, he or she finds gaps in just about every phyletic series. Went through his entire book, all he could come up with about a half a dozen alleged transitions. That is not evolution. That is supporting there had to be a creator. That's what his book really supports, is a creator, whether he knew it or not. Fossil record. Based on the evolution model, the entire foundation for the Darwinian evolution, the fossil record is missing. You know where we go now? Why should I accept evolution when you cannot produce the evidence? I already have a faith. Tell me about your faith and I'll tell you about my faith. Didn't we just do that in about six minutes? The entire fossil record. You see, if they're going to go off to these, oh, this, this archaeopteryx, this missing link between dinosaurs and birds, don't go there unless you're prepared to. Go back down to the foundation. Stick to the foundations. If they don't have a foundation, they have no starting point. See, we have three foundational questions so far. Where did the matter come from? How did life originate? Where are the millions of transitions between the Precambrian and Cambrian? So therefore, it is logical and reasonable to believe that God, not unknown events, created all life after his kind. See, we have a logical and reasonable faith. It is not a blind faith to believe in the Bible. We have a rock solid foundation. We have answers. So far, the evolutionists have no starting point for what they believe. So let's go to the last one now. Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. It's all about asking the right question. See, the common question is, what happened to the dinosaurs? That's a common question. Okay, it's a good question, but it's the common question. You see, the more important question to be asking about dinosaurs is, where did they come from? Why is that an important question? Well, I've been to museums all over this world. You know what I see in the museums? Dinosaurs. I open up all these books. What do I see? Pictures of dinosaurs. What am I not seeing? All the thousands or millions of transitions that led up to the dinosaurs. Why are these transitions not in the museums? How about a thought here? Just a thought. They never existed. If those transitions were readily available, I believe they would be in the museums, but we don't see them. See, the standard story is dinosaurs evolved about 220 million years ago and died out long before man evolved. Folks, great claims require real evidence. Where are the bones of all these transitions? We don't find them. The Illustrated Encyclopedia of Dinosaurs makes this statement. The question of the origin of dinosaurs is one that has puzzled paleontologists for many years. Wouldn't it be nice to see that statement in a textbook? Wow, that's an honest statement. How about this one? The Natural History Museum Book of Dinosaurs. Where did dinosaurs come from? That apparently simple question has been the subject of intense debate among scientists for over 150 years. In other words, we don't know scientifically where the dinosaurs came from, but if you open up the Bible, you'll find out dinosaurs were created on day six, the land animals. If evolution is unable to provide the thousands of transitions for the origin of dinosaurs, then it is without a foundation. Why should I accept evolution when you cannot produce the evidence? I already have a faith. Tell me about your faith, and I'll tell you about my faith. And oh, by the way, would you tell me what your faith has to offer me? And I'll tell you what my faith has to offer you in Jesus Christ. Right back to the gospel. Therefore, it is logical and reasonable to believe that God, not unknown events, created the dinosaurs. We have a reasonable and rational faith, not a blind faith, but a very logical faith. We have answers. We have answers for every one of those foundational questions. Evolution does not. No beginnings, no starting point. So what is evolution then? If it can't be defended scientifically, what is it? Evolution is a faith-based belief system. It cannot be defended scientifically. No foundation for what they believe. But the Bible does offer us a foundation. The Bible offers us answers. Teaches us who created, what was created, how it was created, when it was created, how long it took to create. But you know the greatest thing about all that is? The one who did all that says you can have a personal relationship with him. That he loves you and he cares for you. That is the great statement about our creator. The one who called all that into existence cares for each and every one of you. 
Now I'm going to finish with a final story here. Final story. I used to be an evolutionist. In fact, I was an evolutionist until I was 30 years old. I also used to be an athlete. For those of you who understand physics and the second law of thermodynamics, here it is. In action. One day I was in a gymnasium lifting weights. You have to lift weights. If you want to run around circles faster, throw things further and jump higher, you have to lift the weights. And as I was in that gymnasium that day lifting the weights, a man came up and sat down beside me and for the first time in my life someone presented the gospel to me. Then he asked me some questions. I answered all his questions wrong and ignored everything he had to tell me because I had no room in my life for God then. Seven years after that, I was on a business trip to Indianapolis. I was in computers at that time. I got done work late one evening, got back to the motel room, got in bed, and as I lie there in bed that night, I finally understood that message. That is the night I got on my knees and professed Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And as I crawled back into bed, I still couldn't go to sleep because I had a desire to teach the book of Genesis, which I had not read yet. So I reached into the drawer in that motel room and pulled out the Bible and began reading the book of Genesis. And as I read, I instantly knew if I couldn't trust that first chapter, I was not going to bother reading any other part of the Bible because I couldn't trust it. Or some, not all, but some of what I was taught at universities was not true. So I had the opportunity to travel all over this country and I talked to these professors and I asked the scientists the questions, the foundational questions. I soon found a pattern to their answers. They had a lot of wonderful stories but not one of them could answer the questions. So I decided why should I believe in evolution when all these learned men could not provide answers for me but when I turned to God's Word I found answers, I found hope. So I became a creationist. I did not compromise His Word. Several years ago, my wife and I, Leslie, were on a six-week speaking tour throughout the southeast. Six weeks we were on the road speaking about creation evolution. We stopped in one place in Jacksonville, Florida. And we got there, we were staying with a pastor that night. And we, after we got there, I sat across from this pastor. And we began talking about the Bible. We talked about creation evolution. Then we started talking about some other things we had done. We, and we found out we had both been in the Marine Corps at the same time. And once you find out you've been in the Corps, it kind of gives you an instant bond. So we began to reminisce. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> we began to reminisce what we had done in the Corps. And we found out we had both been stationed at Quantico, Virginia, a large Marine Corps training base. So we reminisced what we had done there, the people we knew. And we continued to talk and talk. And then we found out we had both been stationed at Yuma, Arizona at the same time, a small Marine Corps air and missile base. So we reminisced about that and talked and talked and all of a sudden he sat back in his chair, stopped talking and he looked right at me. And then he said this, I remember you. Do you remember me? 27 years ago in a gymnasium I gave you the gospel presentation. <laughs> Same man. See God brought us back together again because that man did what he was supposed to do and what each and every one of us here is commanded to do. And that is go out and give the truth. Don't worry about changing anybody's lives because we can't do that. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Doesn't that make it easier? Just go out and give the truth. It took me seven years to understand it. So don't worry about time. But you know, you can't give that truth. You can't bring down those strongholds if you don't know the truth. Simply hearing apologetics does not make you an apologist. You must go out and practice the apologetics. We need to make sure we know how to do it so the next generation knows how to do it. God bless you.